Hey, this is Bill Foote, and it's uh, decision modeling with spreadsheets. Uh, this is week six, and I wanted to walk through uh, the assignment for the week, which is to produce a year four forecast. A forecast in the way that we look at things is not a single number. Uh, it's not like the IMF saying it's uh, going to be 3% growth this year. The IMF actually says it's a range of numbers, and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, as an example, uh, actually has the plausibility associated with each component on an interval. Traditional stats calls that a confidence interval. We're calling it a probability or credibility or compatibility with the data interval. And some of that data is uh, notional in, in various ways. Most of it's observed. And, and here we have the forecast. The forecast is from a small of five to a, a, a high of uh, about 30,000. Uh, these are in uh, uh, thousands. Um, so this is five million, actually. You can see that most of the probability, the blue is the forecast. Uh, the theoretical forecast uh, is the GPD, which is the um, generalized Pareto distribution is given as well. As you can see, the, uh, the yellow is, is in the legend here. Of course, we have this strange bathtub going on here. Um, that's simulation for you. The GPD is actually, I just wrote this over here, is actually a combination of two uh, distributions. It's a mixture uh, where uh, we have an underlying, looks very similar to the gamma, and the gamma is related to the bell-shaped um, uh, normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. You can see that errors are pinched toward the center. And if you take that pinching of errors, deviations from a mean that you see here, and splice that or mix that with um, the arrival of new information, which is this exponential distribution, you get the generalized Pareto distribution. And its shape over here is very dominant, very dominant in that exponential shape, you can see that. And exponential shapes, uh, especially in forecasts, tend to have a very, very thick tail. Very large, so-called rare occurrences can occur. They're not that rare. And it's rare in probability. But that's our forecast. Where do we get that from? We get it from this table. A table of 21 intervals. Now let me expand this a little bit. What I'm doing here is I'm working backward into the logic of our model and going all the way back and showing all the pieces. So we have 21 intervals with beginning, end, and mid. There's the beginning. It starts with the minimum of whatever that grid is here, 400. And it's literally counting from uh, uh, all of the instances in a simulation that we'll go back to. So this a simulation feeds this, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, uh, and we have these non-overlapping intervals. So it, it turns out using count ifs and two conditions, the condition uh, for the beginning and the condition for the end, one is less than or equal to, that's the beginning, I'm sorry, greater than or equal to, that's the beginning, and less than the end. And then the next one down is equal to the previous, and so on. And we build the non-overlapping intervals that way. The count is basically shows that most of the um, instances of the forecast are somewhere between 400 and 1,700. 45% of the time. And that's a, that's a cumulative probability, actually. 
when, when you look at it from the beginning to the end of that interval. And then we add to that cumulative probability the, the uh, increment in the next interval, which is 982 instances out of 10,000, by the way. And uh, that comes up with uh, another 9% for a total of 55%. And we get approximately, well, let's, let's take, uh, already we're at the median here. <laughs> uh, okay, pretty much at the median between these two. Um, uh, from 400 to 3 million, 400,000 to 3 million, and then from 400,000 to uh, uh, almost 4.5 million, you know, we're up to 60% and so on, and it keeps growing. And it only gets as high as 70%. And then we have this huge lump at the end, very, very large lump, about half the size of the first one, where we can have some very, very large scale activities. Uh, in, in terms of claims experience here. Here's the GPD on this side, which uh, follows a formula. Do look at that formula. Do try to pull it apart. It uses the mean of the sigma that has been simulated and the mean of the C term, which is the power term uh, in, in, in this setup as the... Um, and here's here's the power here's the power term right here it's raised to an exponent uh, it's called the power law in some by some people and uh, uh, we have the PMF here and and what we need to do is translate this to uh, a normalized um, probability distribution function that's the difference between a probability mass function and a probability distribution function too much math stats, yes. And um, and then we get the cumulative density in exactly the same way that we did frequency and relative frequency and cumulative relative frequency. This in a, the frequency is like a mass. And then we get the relative mass. And then we get the cumulative relative. Raw GBD is like the mass, you know, the, the frequency mass and so on. Okay. So that's that's where we get that from so you saw a number of different things here uh not the least of which is the indirect of c3 what's c3 ah it's four we could have we could have done five in which case we have different slightly different results but not horribly different each of the years is going to, uh, in our model, our model is very naive. Uh, it thinks each year is pretty much the same idea, by the way. And, and, I, and we have the different years. And we can say that the years uh, may have a trend because of certain other elements that we might need to add, like uh, more people, less credentials, less training changes like pandemics occur uh you name it and over here uh we have the max the min um number of intervals to define in year five i'm supposed to do year four there we go uh here we uh create uh we can create two key fences which is uh 20, uh, uh, the 25th quantile, here's, here's the mean, uh, the me median. Notice the uh, mean and the median are radically different. Nine million versus two million. Notice the 75th percentile is very, very high, very close to the max. And the IQR, which is the interquartile range, probably gives the best idea, the most robust idea of range. Yes, they are for range. Whereas the standard deviation is quite a bit lower. Uh, the mean absolute deviation is very similar to the standard deviation. It's a pretty strong skewness. 
and uh, fairly uh, thick tails. So we we have that in our forecast. And when you have a have a um, uh, you see the formulas. Um, year four is a defined or named range. So let's find out where that comes from. Where does the named range come from? Okay, year four. Well, if we go over here and look up the named range for year four. We can we can find it. Okay, we're doing an excavation. We're we're going layer and layer and layer into this ancient city, you know. And we're going to start. We've got to take off each layer very very carefully in this excavation. Uh, let me see if I can find this again. There we go. Oh, there it is. And that's how you work backwards. So how, where did this come from? Okay, so we have the different years being forecasted. And right now the years are not related to one another. Um, they could be. Uh, they are in this particular model independently and identically distributed. Um, not quite identically. The, the sampling is the same, yes. Sampling method. That comes from, oh, here. And if we go to the developer, we can actually see the code that was used. So we don't want solve capital. What do we want? Oh, assignment two. Yes, this is actually assignment number two. And, uh, That's the solver for claims. Here we go, claims. So we have a calculation, an interface, and a simulation. So let's look those up. Calculation for claims. Oh, this is what's being calculated and recalculated 10,000 times. And each time it's recalculated, this gets, okay. Here are the claims. Here are the simulated claims for seven years. You see that these are just mirror images down here. And then these are transferred over to an interface. Let's look at that quickly. Interface claims. Yep, it's transferred over here. See the transfer mechanism. And then finally, there's a simulation piece. Simulation uh, report literally every time this is run. And it goes here. And simulation uses something called offset. This is row zero. So the first run will be row one and it will deposit it here and then the next run will tell it to go to the next row wherever the previous row was now go to the next row that is how offset operates it's a very good function for producing uh, output like this and in this case all the way down to ten thousand. okay nice nice idea of well I guess it's the mathematical idea of continuity. And so here, here we are again at year four. And down here, you can see the sums and the count, 10,000 of them, and the average of uh, 9.3 9 million, which is what we saw before. Now, where did these simulations come from? Okay. Now, now we're getting into it. Now we're getting into it. That's the claim simulation. Here's where the simulations actually come from, 10,000 times over. 
So this is equal to the min for year, well, we'll do it year two, year three, uh, here's four. Okay, this is equal to the min of AA54. So you have to go back to figure out where AA54 is. Oh, that's the maximum claim. We don't want it to exceed that. Now we might want to change that. We might want to change that to 50,000, 50 million actually. Now that's a big, big claim, right? That's not even in the data, but that doesn't mean we can't simulate it. Okay, so we choose that, that ceiling and otherwise choose this random variable called uh, take the threshold, whatever that is, and add to it W6. What is W6? Ah, sigma, simulated sigma. Uh, times uh, a random number between uh, zero and one. Uh, and let's see if I can pull this up a little bit. No, oh, see, every time you move it, it changes. There we go. There we go. So, and that that number is raised to the minus v power. V6 power, rather V6, V6 is, is C. So W6 is sigma, that's the C. Uh, minus one divided by V6. That's how this is produced. Now you can look this up in, in Wikipedia, which has a very good um, compendium on how to generate uh, 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 random numbers following a generalized Pareto distribution. And we do this for each of the seven years, right? actually year, years two to seven. Here are the formulas here and here. Now, okay, now where did we get these from? Keep working backwards. Where did the 655 sigma come from? Where did the 3.3c uh, come from? The sigma comes from a norm inverse of a norm uh, norm dis distribution. This is called a copula. It's a way to join um, uh, different aspects of distributions together. And it's key to the forecast to be able to do this. You take the norm inverse of something, you're actually calculating the value associated with a quantile. And the quantile is this complicated thing here, rho times rand plus to the half rand. That, that should look familiar. That was Cholesky relating uh, random numbers together. Okay, so this is a random number between zero and one that is correlated with this random number over here. Oh my gosh, we have sigma being correlated with C. That was the point. That's what we also did with the waiting, waiting line in the um, uh, previous week, last week. Okay, and uh, mu sigma, sigma, sig sigma, that's just a definition of what we think is the mean and the standard deviation of sigma in general. Okay, and 3.3, .3, this is the uh, initial random variable. Uh, and uh, it's a number between zero and one, so it acts like a quantile. And norm inverse is the quantile or percentile uh, following the normal distribution. And that's okay, we can use any distribution we want. We typically use the normal distribution on these variables because they are averages. And averages tend to follow the normal distribution. Okay, so we have those and where are we getting mu C and mu sigma and sig c and sig sigma and and the covariant and the row where are all these things coming from look at these sum products let's just do one and show how it works keep working backwards this is reverse engineering b4 to b8 c4 to c8 okay let's see where those are b4 
B4. Oh, these are probabilities. Are these probabilities? Oh, gosh, do they even they add up to one? The probabilities between zero and one, and they add up to one. Wonderful, and they make some sort of sense, I suppose. Here are different levels of C, getting it off of a C sigma grid. What grid is that? Now we have to go to grid setup. Oh, it's this grid. Oh, I see. So we're even simulating the different values of this exponent in the distribution and the sigma of this distribution. Oh, that's where the grid comes from. Oh, okay, fine. And here's the actual numbers. Okay, so it's coming from this. And sigma will be the same coming from this. These are all simulations within simulations. Gotta be why this is going to look complicated. Okay. But this is when we when we do the sum product of this, we multiply the probability times the outcome, add to that the product of the probability and the outcome, and so on. That sum product is the is a weighted average of, of the of the C's that we're simulating, but it's the expected value of the C's. And then we can take deviations and deviation squared to calculate the sigma. The sigma will be these probabilities product with the with uh, dev squared. Okay. And that will be the sigma of it. And we add those up and take the square root of all of that sum product and we get the standard deviation of C. Do exactly the same thing with sigma. Calculate this product, add to it this product, add to it this product, and so on to get the expected sigma. Find the deviations from the expected sigma. And then go ahead and calculate the squared deviations to calculate. And again, we take each one of these and multiply them term by term, it's called an inner product, with their probabilities of occurrence, another expected value. But then you make got to make sure when you when you calculate, they have to take the um Okay, square root of it. Okay, so we 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 have that, and let's see if we can look at anything else here. And just a little change here. We had to be sure that the uh, the uh, uh, sum product, which is the sum of squared deviations, we have to take the square root of that because we're actually we actually need the standard deviation of each of these terms. And uh, you can see there's a slight change in all of these. Uh, rho is the uh, correlation and it is equal to the covariance divided by the, um, by the uh, product of the two standard deviations for uh, those sigmas. Okay. Now, does this change anything? Not, not too much over here. It'll be pretty much the same. Uh, just just uh, go, when we go back and look at the simulation, uh, we will see very, very little change from anything here. But that, that's, how, that's how we develop it. Okay, here's the correlation development, where we take deviations of the two, C and, and sigma, and multiply them. You can see they're partially negative, partially positive, mostly positive. Again, again, here we take the probability of C and sigma, which we still have to look at, and normalize it. 
okay, to make it a probability distribution. That's critical. Normalization is a, is a standard, standard procedure. Well, where do those come from? They come from this grid. And these are all joint probabilities of a value of sigma and a value of, of C. It's at a threshold of 400. If we made this 500, everything would change again. See a change. Okay. And that's actually from way over here in the grid approximation. There we go. And is that true? Let me pull these back. So that's coming from mu threshold. Where is mu threshold? Mu threshold is right. Start fooling around with 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 the sheet. That works perfectly fine. Mu threshold comes all the way from over here. Here it is. Okay, so that's specified. Specified by the user. Matter of fact, it's so specified by the user. Why don't we? Uh, And these are specified by the user too. The grids. Everything else is calculated. Okay, all specified by the user. Now that's a little bit better. Okay, good. And back to the grid approximation. So given that threshold, which comes from mu threshold, Here's our data. Where does the data come from? All of this data comes from somewhere, comes from claims, comes from over here. Yeah. Comes from claims. Comes from these very claims. It says claims. Okay, so keep going back and forth. That's where the data comes from. Here is uh, from the grid setup the minimum C. And then there is some complicated if then statements um, to make sure that for each C, and we only have five of them, we run through each of the different sigmas. And that's again a very typical procedure where we're trying to get at uh, all of the possible combinations, pairings of C and sigma hypotheses. In this case, we have 25 of them, five by five, we have 25 of them. Okay. We could say it's one fifth. Um, this will all work out without uh, uh, any kind of change, but it's probably one twenty-fifth. But I, I used it just for each cell here, and that's fine. But 1 25th is actually correct. Okay. And we can see one more thing that, that was done here with the threshold. With a threshold of 400, this data, this data, this data, this data, this data, this data, this data are not important anymore. We can see they have probability of one, which which is fine. Um, they really don't have a probability of one, but it, they act as if they have a probability of one. When we multiply the joint probability of the hypotheses occurring and, I, and all of these together, all the way out to the end here to produce the probability of the data given the hypothesis. Now we do this for all of them. And uh, we see that some of them over here are actually producing some little bit of uh, probability. And um, uh, we add all of these up. OK, 
Okay, that's that. And then multiply them all together. That's This is the all together one. Add those up, normalize them to get a relative probability of a hypothesis, this line versus this line. Hypothesis given the data. And, and still is it in, in a way that we can use it. And we need to use a key to identify each and every one of these hypotheses when we go back to this grid. When we go back to this grid, how do we get that number? The number that's associated with a, a 0.5 and a 50. How do we get that number? We get that number using this index of the probability of the hypothesis of, of uh, uh, given the data and a match of the splicing together of this 0.5 dash 50 and see what row that is in the key and zero. And that's how we generate all of these, every single one of these joint probabilities. In turn, these are all either or statements at 50, 0 0.5. 0 0.5 works across 50 to 87, all of these to yield a probability at the end, either or we add them up of 0 0.002. And then the next row, the next C of 1.65 is probability of 0.176 and 0 0.305 and so on. And you can see that these all add up to ah, one. Same thing, same thing. Each one of these sigmas occurs at different C levels. And so we have to add up those probabilities, either or, either or, either or, all the way down the line. They're all independent of one another. And similarly, these will all add up to one. So we now have a probability distribution of sigmas and c's that we use when we created all of these expected values, which in turn were all used to generate new c's, new sigmas, and a forecast. And then we did it 10,000 times. Please remember that. Okay, we're almost, we're almost done. So here's the C grid. That's the grid approximation that, that, that uh, produced the C grid. Here's the setup for the C grid itself. And here, here's the grid values. Each one of those has to be matched against each one of these. Five by five. And uh, here we have a, a EDA of the data itself showing these bubbling up pieces i love that okay and uh at a uh at a threshold okay uh, this is the mean excess i'm not going to go through this uh you can reverse engineer it i think i'd have a different discussion about this this is typically used to uh figure out what the threshold ought to be. I mean, I, I picked a really low threshold right here. I can pick other thresholds as well. Um, there is no good science on this. There never has been. But I think we can come up with a principled way eventually of jointly estimating the right threshold along with C and along with sigma. It doesn't work out so well. A little bit hard to figure out what all of those pieces are. But I have not seen good science on this yet. Science meaning good logic. Here's our original data. We have a data dictionary, which is produced by going to formulas, using formula, at the bottom, paste names at a spot up there, and all of these will come up come apart. This way we have lots of different things like the eateries and visits are not necessary we probably should get rid of those those are from a different system a drop box toggle where did that come from oh taco viva oh my gosh i remember that model and that's the problem okay and then 
we finally have our results here, which show and we start out where we where we uh, we finish where we started from. We have our forecast. Anyways, that's my walkthrough, and I'm holding to it for the time being. And uh, uh, and, and I hope that happy note. Let's just simulate this one more time and see what happens. On that happy note, we're going to, uh, there we go, congratulations. We could write a different note in there if we wanted to. And we get this, uh, it's slightly different than before, but not much. Instead of 4,500, 5,600, okay, is it, you're getting basically the same thing. You run this several times, you'll get an average of all these. Typically in Monte Carlo, we run several of these chains um, and then uh, average them. It's all Monte Carlo. Okay, so you've done a forecast, a complicated forecast, using extreme value distributions and a copula. My gosh, oh my, lots of stuff going on. I'm going to leave you with this. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope it's been helpful. Thanks for your kind attention.